Have you ever watched a movie and you noticed that there were black bars going across the top and the bottom and that the film was kind of stretched uh, the very long, right? But there, there was still some black space at the top and bottom. Well, generally, uh, when you see something like that, it's, it's shot with an anamorphic lens, okay? There are ways to cheat that, and a lot of people will shoot with a regular lens and then just crop out part of their photo and put black bars at the top and bottom. Well, they're losing 50% of the footage they shoot. It's hard to compose like that. And they also miss out on the most important factors of shooting anamorphic. And that is the bokeh that turns oval and also the flaring that we get from strong light sources. And lastly is the stretch that we get. So the idea here, guys, is that if you use these anamorphic lenses, it'll help your viewers to feel like they're looking at something cinematic. It will bring back that memory. It's not something that people consciously think of, but when they see oval bokeh, when they see flaring, they think, even if it's in the back of their subconscious, they immediately start thinking movies, cinema, things like that. Go watch a J.J. Abrams movie or uh, any kind of science fiction movie. Uh, some of them can be a 1.33, that's very common, where it's about 33% longer than normal. Or we could do a 1.5, they have 1.75s, and then very commonly a, a Cinemascope 2X. Most of Hollywood, when they shoot anamorphic, they're using 80 to $160,000 lenses. Yep, that's one lens at $100,000. <laughs> So there's lots of expensive anamorphics out there right now, and those are the ones that the big guys use. There's a lot of movie theaters that are shutting down. Everyone's watching movies at home, and the theaters are shutting down, and guess what they have when they shut down in their movie projection booth? Well, they're projecting the film with these lenses. These lenses are made to be put in movie theaters. It projects lengthwise that long, horizontal view. That's how we get it, using these lenses. But what we found is we can take these lenses, instead of using them to project in a movie theater, we can take them, find ways to attach them to our regular mirrorless and DSLR cameras, and use them to record and then de-squeeze them in post or later on. And I'm going to show you guys that. Okay, guys, so to start, we have this German-made lens. This is very inexpensive. And they're in, uh, usually in very good condition because they just sit around projecting at movie theaters. But uh, the glass is, is pristine on this one. Um, and it's got a purple coating, which helps give great purple flares. Um, the only downside on it is that it's very large and it's very heavy. Not something you want to swing around your neck on, on a camera strap. Iscorama Red. Uh, this is the sharpest anamorphic lens on the market. There's nothing sharper anywhere and you have to pay for that premium. And then I have a, a Nikon taking lens on it as well and we'll talk some more about that soon. I even went through the trouble of removing some lens coatings on the front element and on the rear element um, but we also have lens coatings inside the lenses on the front and rear elements 
and there's also glass in between that. So I cannot remove those coatings. Um, again, I'm just not getting any flare at all out of this, but the sharpest one you can find. And then I have a, a Nikon taking lens on it as well, and we'll talk some more about that soon. Also, I have a single focus adapter. Usually with anamorphics, you need to focus twice. Once with your taking lens, and then also with your anamorphic lens. Who the hell, who, who the hell wants to try and focus twice when they're trying to get focus on something? It's ridiculous. So this basically is a, nothing more than a range finder. Two pieces of glass mashed together, and you put it in front of your anamorphic lens here, and what you can do is use this as a single point of focus. And this one is the Schneider shoot-through. This you'd get on uh, some rails. You'd have some 15 millimeter rails. You put it on and then you'd have your other camera kind of up next to it like this. And I'm going to be setting this up a little bit later for you to have a better look. But um, again, this is going to be the best flaring and bokeh producing anamorphic lens I have. Now this is the Moller, made in Germany. Now this lens is much smaller and lighter. I mean, it's like two different worlds, right? But the reality is I get much better production value from this than I ever would from this. Um, the Moller is soft, but does very well with flaring. So I use it a lot when I really need flares. Um, it's very light and transportable. There's plenty of them on eBay. So check them out. Again, it's the Moller, M-O-L-L-E-R, made in Germany. These lenses never were ever made with the intention of being able to screw these onto the outer threads of regular prime lenses, okay? They're never made for that. So you're not going to find um, rear mounts that would fit a normal DSLR mirrorless camera. Look at the size of this. Um, you'll need to use step-down rings where basically you'll put it on the outer thread of your lens you'll find whatever diameter this is and get yourself a step down ring and you'll step down until you've matched the diameter of your taking lens or the lens that you're going to screw it onto and these will help you get from here to here hey youtubers 
Thanks for checking out this video and watching the lens flare tests. Uh, just wanted to give you guys an idea of what you can expect when it comes to lens flaring and the type of different kind of lenses that are out there available for you to mod onto your DSLR or mirrorless camera. A lot more people are doing this now and it's a lot of fun. I am no expert in this by any means, but I have been through a lot of learning and I do have some experience now with it. I'm just trying to pass some of that on to you, okay? I do realize that some of this footage was not all necessarily in focus, to say the least. Again, it was really more a flare test. We're going to do a focus test next using some of these lenses too to give you an idea of sharpness, uh, but that'll be next, okay? So after all of this, there's just a few things I want to recap on that are important for you while you're shopping or looking around, if you think this is something you want to do. Um, don't waste your money buying, a, you know, climbing yourself up the ladder and then ultimately buying the lens that you're going to get anyway. Do a lot of research, you know, watch videos like this, look online and, and you can see and get an idea of the type of footage that you're going to get from different lenses and maybe you can make a decision based off that. A lot of people go to eBay and buy a two, three hundred dollar lens from Russia or uh, Japan and very happy with the results and, and good enough. So be it, right? And so that can work for you. So uh, don't get carried away with um, having to feel like you have to get the, the best, most expensive lens of all time. A lot of these lower end lenses work just fine, especially with the two X's. Do yourself a favor and get some 15 millimeter rods and some sort of rig that you can use to put a shoot through uh, lens on, like the Schneider that I'm showing you here, that's a great setup. I can autofocus through that. With my D850, I can use autofocus and then snap back to manual, of course, and shoot and quickly catch focus. I don't have to deal with uh, setting my lenses to infinity and then getting the rangefinder and all of that. So it's really useful to have a, a shoot through lens that's set in front of your regular lens because it makes focus life way easier, okay? Also, up front, when you're first getting started, don't make flaring the reason you buy an expensive lens. The aesthetic of flaring is going to wear off pretty quickly when you go down the road of anamorphic, and you're gonna to start to realize that things like sharpness around the edges and, and, and weight are way more important than um, the very occasional flare that you're gonna shoot. What I like to do is I have a lens that I use just for flaring, and if I need to go out and shoot, uh, to catch a flare, I'll do that, but when I go outside in the regular daylight and I want to shoot a scene, I'm certainly not using that, I'm using my red ISCO. Another thing I want to bring up is that rangefinders, single focus adapters, extremely important, worth every penny. They can range from 400 to 700 bucks for a little device, but man, is it worth it. You can focus with one lens that way. It's much more useful. You have to be able to rack focus when you're shooting, right? Well, you cannot rack focus unless you've got a single point of focus to do that. So I found that that is one of the most important tools in my toolkit, okay? Another thing, very important, stay level. With anamorphic, you have to be level. If you're not level, all your verticals are going to look like this. The whole scene is going to be off. And yeah, you can fix it in post, but it's a pain in the butt and you're going to have to crop some to do that. So I highly suggest using tripods every time you can. If you have to run and gun, I'm getting real tired of saying that expression, but if you have to be running and gunning and you have to be hand holding, then do everything you can to stay level. Bring that level up on your camera and use it. It is important. And lastly, get yourself a cage for your camera body and some rods. It's so important. There's so many reasons why it's important. You can attach things to it, like I've got this monitor and Atomos recorder here. At the top, I can get handles. The further my hands are from the sensor, the more stable I am. That's just physics, okay? Uh, so it will be a little heavier, your footage will be more stable. You'll have a support for your lens, right? You don't want that pulling on your camera mount all day. So that's important. And look how quick this is. In one, two, three, I can pull this off of here and be shooting, okay? And I can stay level with my level on my camera, and then I can move around, get angles, whatever it is I need to do, and then quickly just put this back on, and then it's one, two, three, and it's locked back in, and I'm, and I'm level and I can keep shooting. So um, a quick release is important, staying level is important. But those are the things that I found are most important when starting out with anamorphic guys. Keep those pointers in mind, 
don't waste a bunch of money. Start out with something affordable and uh, stay level, range finder, and you're off and running, okay? So good luck. We're going to be doing a focus test next. So stay tuned for that, and we'll see you on the next video. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Guys, I need your help. I want you to let me know what you think about the video footage compared to the, some of my older stuff. Um, I was shooting with a Z6 for most of my videos for YouTube, and I've switched over. I bought myself a GH5 used for a smoking good price. I got it for 1100 bucks, so I'm excited about that. But I want to know how the footage looks compared to some of my older stuff that was shot with the Z6. So let me know what your thoughts are on that, and we'll see you guys. Thanks.